Ready? So, hello everyone. Welcome to the final panel of the AIFA conference. How's everyone doing? Excited, inspired, feeling hopeful, learned a few things, made some friends, I hope. So I'm Sergio Nabel, I'm uh, IFA's board chair. Uh, and the focus of this last panel is financing green energy solutions. Uh, so at IFA, you've seen over the last few days that we are very focused on the energy transition. We want to move away from energy that requires burning things and towards energy that protects our climate. So private finance and government incentives are big drivers of what gets built and which technology remains cost competitive. Investment helps to drive economies of scale for new technologies, bringing down their cost. So absent the market failures caused by incumbency, inertia, regulatory capture, and old boy networks, that increasingly cheaper cost of clean energy over fossil energy is going to speed the transition. The International Renewable Energy Agency estimated last March that we need to triple energy generation by 2050 and that we must invest 35 trillion in clean energy technologies by 2030 to stay on target to hold warming to 1.5 degrees. Last year, the world set a record with over a trillion invested, but we need to more than quadruple that annual rate. So fortunately, we're seeing exponential growth in the deployment of renewable energy, battery storage, and EVs. And we'd like to see an equally steep and sustained growth in the flows of capital towards clean. So the discussion we're about to have has two dimensions. The first is about what government and civil society can do to drive capital toward low carbon, low carbon energy and industry. And the second is what we need to do to make sure that it's actually clean. So we have four speakers who have worked in different parts of the world and across banking, asset management, financial regulation, and policy advocacy to help us uh, look at these issues. So going down the list here, we have uh, James Vaccaro, who is the executive director of the Climate Safe Lending Network and CEO of Repattern. He advises banks around the world on sustainable banking and investment, and previously uh, led strategy development for the Triodos Group, Europe's leading international sustainable banking and investment institution. James has served uh, on numerous advisory groups, including the Global Steering Committee for the UNEP Finance Initiative, and is one of the founders of the UN Principles for Responsible Banking. Uh, he actually wears several other interesting hats in the world of sustainable finance, so I suggest you check out his bio because I could be here all, all morning, all afternoon. Uh, next uh, is uh, Nana Lee, who is the head of sustainability and stewardship for Asia Pacific at Impacts Asset Management uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, she leads the firm's ESG research. Previously, Nana was the Asian Corporate Governance was uh, with the Asian Corporate Governance Association, where she served as research and project director for China. The working group she chaired there included a group of investors with over 25 trillion in assets under management. Next, we have uh, Gregory Hirschman, who's the head of US policy for UNPRI, the Principles of Responsible Investment, based out of Washington, DC. He works with Congress, regulators, business allies, and signatories to the UNPRI to build a sustainable financial system right here in the world's largest capital market. Uh, prior to this, he worked in the US Senate in various roles. And last but not least, we have Bridget Boll, who directs technical developments for the Climate Bonds Initiative, where she's responsible for the policy standards, taxonomy, and market intelligence teams. She has been involved in the development of green investment taxonomies, and we'll ask her more about that in a, in a minute, in Asia, Australia, and the EU China Common Ground taxonomy. And she does, does all of this out of South Africa. <clears throat> so what an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, so we'll just jump into the discussion. 
So, oh, I should say one other thing. So we, um, we were trying to figure out, so what's the special sauce of this team here? And uh, you know, they're all coming from the perspective of working with or being investors. So these are the capitalists. <laughs> OK, so what role, what role does policy have in uh, driving clean energy investment? You want to take that, James? Uh, actually, all of you, but maybe you could start. Sure. Thanks, Sergio. And um, thanks to Aifa. It's been a really great few days. Um, maybe, maybe first to dissect what we mean by policy, because policy is hugely influential. But to calibrate it, you've got, you've got financial regulations, things which can be driving the rules. There can be things which you're disclosing. And then there's the policy which actually drives real economy transition and decisions on the ground. Um, and in my, in my role, when I, in banking, it was much more about, well, what is it which is actually going to get the stuff moving into the real economy, getting new things done? So in terms of, in terms of policy, a lot of policy can sometimes, uh, in a transition, take all the pain and risk away. So in COVID, um, UK government said, oh, we'll just give a guarantee for everything, blanket uh, guarantee to banks to write loans. And what you see then is it's like, well, you, you get 68 billion of lending, 26 billion of which was mostly fraudulent uh, to companies which didn't even exist. So not great policy you know, value for money. Um, policies are good at stopping things. You can ban things. You put a tariff on something. You put a penalty on something. You can stop things. So what are the, what are the things which you can do to drive markets and, and actually kind of like make the flows go towards uh, innovation um, and finance people will say well what we need most of all is just stability we want we want you know really predictable stable things and I remember saying that in the early days of renewable energy we want we want to be able to see this sort of thing for the next 20 years difficulty is uh, governments change um, it's quite polarized everywhere in the world so it swings back and forth um, it, there's disruptive innovation all the time policy is not going to be stable so maybe the better question is, what is the role of finance given that policy is not going to be stable? Um, and that's where you get into the role of finance, where, where again, f f for me, it's all about what is it that finance does, not just what it is. So finance is not just the pile of cash wanting to be allocated. Finance, to finance something, is an act, needs to be an active verb, especially if it's going to be transitioned. It's in stuff which has not been done before. And that's, that very subtle kind of shift moves away from like, how do you just allocate capital like from a tall tower? And I've been walking around the streets here where you see the abandoned towers of wealth in the financial district. Uh, impotent at being able to deal with any of the societal challenges 200 feet on the ground, which is kind of an analogy in a way of transition right now, and think, how can you move from that paradigm to what do you need to do to roll your sleeves up and get into driving what's called the endogenous growth? So the wind market, for example, is a terawatt now of installed wind capacity. But it didn't just emerge from the ocean or, like, or the, the land as like a massive mature market. It started with people doing it for the first time. I was doing single wind turbines in the late 90s. Um, and through that, you actually get to build experience. You standardize contracts. You share your experience. You, you are an advocate for what is possible because you're willing to finance it, which drives and influences policy. You can get regulations changed based upon the risk data that you can share. And that's what drives markets. It makes things cheaper. It drives demand. Um, and and in, terms of, in terms of the overall shift, towards a new economy, a clean economy, we need to take what we've done successfully globally on wind and solar and do that on EV and batteries and the things which are like nature-based solutions to be able to make these markets which, which work so that we can get out of the, the, the allocation uh, zone and into influencing the kind of the policy interventions. And, and frankly, banks and financial institutions should do it, especially banks, because they've got a social license to operate 
which is which is bigger than anyone else because they're still effectively underwritten by by governments. So they should be uh, uh, doing that. And if they do it successfully, then they'll influence policy and will speed up the, 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 the transition faster than than, than 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 any single kind of policy or law that could be enacted independently by uh, by a government could do. So did you just shoot down the question? I I, I reformulated it. Okay. Thank um, you. I reformulated a little bit. Um, See, but I'm a capitalist, capitalist apparently. Apparently. <laughs> Why don't we go down the line here? Uh, yeah, great. Yeah. Sure. I have to say, first of all, I used to work for NGO for about 10 years before joining SM Management. Oh, the mic isn't. Hello, hello. Okay. So, yeah, so I worked for NGO for about 10 years before joining SM Management. That's the first time I was being called capitalist. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, that's a new thing. Um, so uh, I will be talking mostly about from the Asia perspective because that's my coverage and also my um, base. So I think for Asia, in terms of the um, green finance uh, development policy definitely is the, the main drive uh, behind many markets. For example, um, for, for example, China, uh, we had the President Xi uh, committed to 2060 carbon neutrality before we had any, almost any specific plan. So everything is coming up after uh, he made that commitment. And uh, that's the same case, I think, for many other major in Asian markets nowadays. I think apart from the Philippines, uh, most Asian markets have now made their net zero roadmap from 2050 to 2070 uh, net zero roadmap targets. So policies and also regulators, governments, uh, mostly the, the drive uh, behind all those movements. And for that reason, uh, quite a few Asian markets don't really have a detailed uh, implementation plan yet at this stage. So it's still being be established. And uh, also for that reason, the concern for implementing the uh, net zero policy is very similar to the concern that uh, the governments have on the major economies. So it's the macroeconomic conditions, it's uh, uh, also specific challenges each market face in terms of uh, developing its e economics and also business nowadays with geopolitical uh, tensions, etc. So I think for most Asian markets, this is still early stage. Um, and uh, this month is actually quite important. We, we have the uh, IWSB is going, going to come out, I think, next week with its uh, conclusions. So. Uh, on the on the ESG disclosure and also climate disclosure, so I think that's going to help a lot uh, in terms of the greenwashing issue uh, we have in this market, and uh, also um, the lack of enforcement. I think basically in many markets that uh, related to uh, green finance activities uh, and also the basically the disclosure around the non-financial parts uh, of many of many issues. Thank you. Uh. Those were two, yeah, two great answers. I, I'm gonna maybe say my piece of this world is a bit, it feels a bit narrower from, from, from those, from those uh, explanations. So PRI, when you, when you join the Principles for Responsible Investment, we have 5,300 global signatories. Um, you agree to our six high-level principles. And, and my job is essentially to look at legal and regulatory barriers and say, are we enabling or disabling those signatories from doing what we're asking them to do? Um, and Big Ten organization, 5,000 signatories, they're going, everyone's going to do it a little bit differently, but what are the basic tools that they need uh, or basic barriers that are preventing them? Um, so I think of my team as having six priorities to go along with the six principles. Uh, the first is fiduciary duties. Um, we're sort of seeing some of this fiduciary duty fight coming back up in the US that I think a lot of us thought was maybe settled uh, in the past. Um, so if we're asking you to integrate ESG factors uh, into your investment decisions, you need to, it to be clear that you can do so legally. Uh, shareholder rights, if we're asking you to be an active owner to vote proxies and engage, you need the ability to submit proxies and to vote proxies. Um, investor dis uh, corporate disclosure, if we're asking you to integrate ESG factors, you need that underlying data. Uh, investor disclosure, so eliminating greenwashing, uh, making sure that the end customer knows what they're investing in. Um, global alignment, which is a piece that we hear more and more, that there's so many different regulatory pieces happening in the APAC region, in the EU, with taxonomies. How do these pieces align if we're a global investor? Uh, and then to get to James's second point, outcomes. 
every investment decision isn't necessarily just moving capital from A to B, you're also having other uh, impacts on the real world. So how can an investor think about uh, and maybe even seek to influence those outcomes that, that uh, are coming from those investments? And so when I'm thinking about responsible investment, each of these is almost like a stage gate. And so you can get to fiduciary duties, but maybe you can't do shareholder engagement. Uh, or you have some underlying data, but maybe you don't know what's in that product. And so each of these pieces builds on itself. And, and my work is sort of trying to build that ecosystem of good policies that support responsible investment uh, to let those investors do all of the really cool things that, that James and Nana were talking about. Um. Thanks. Uh, so from the Client Bonds Initiative perspective, we've just written a policy a paper, which is called 101 Policy Solutions. So I've got them all listed here. I thought I might just uh, no. we're, <laughs> um, <we're ready. laughs> I'll just read out 101 solutions for you. Um, no, but we roughly grouped them you know, in a few kind of different buckets. The first was kind of thinking about the vision. So 100% agree with James, policy is not certainty but the lack of some kind of broader vision is a really good get out of jail card, free card for companies. And I've seen this time and time again. Oh, there's no NDC that's aligned with 1.5. Oh, there's no kind of bigger plan. So that is like absolute bare minimum where we kind of start off with around what the kind of bigger commitment is. And then from there, you can kind of go down a level into kind of the provision of a bit more clarity about what is a climate aligned investment? What does that look like? And, I know we'll, I'll bore you to tears about that later. Um, then, then we kind of move into a bit more kind of active role of government around decreasing of risk. Um, and so kind of going to James's point about how do we um, bring a lot of growth to, to new industries and how do we decrease Increase risk, and that is really important in, in certain economies um, over others and certain technologies over others. And then also, then how do we finance the gap? So, kind of going beyond the risk side and really thinking about what are the kind of new and emerging technologies which government needs to take a much more active role in supporting because there's no one else at the table. So, kind of thinking through these different kind of levels of engagement that, um, that and that architecture that's really important. But I think it's also worth saying that all is not lost in a lot of the markets I work with where we're not going to have the support of regulatory uh, architecture. And so there is a lot of stuff that can be done without that policy support, although we do think that policy support is very important. Can I ask you um, about decreasing risk? Can you talk a little bit more about what, what you're doing uh, in that space? So, I mean, there's a lot of various people have spoken um, about this you know, in the last two days yeah. about thinking about. So there's lots of different ways governments can provide incentives. We've seen that in the IRA. We've talked about that. We've seen that in Europe. Um, so there's, there's different ways that you can do incentives. You can have different ways you can think about trade. We'll talk about CBAM and all of those kind of other things. You, there's lots of multilateral development banks, so moving a slight step away from governments acting on their own in the kind of blended finance space. Um, and then there's kind of more innovative things. How do we deal with currency exchange problems um, and, and various kind of measures and governments of some governments and private institutions have come together to, uh, to de-risk kind of uh, currency exchange fluctuations. So there's lots of different kind of tools that are being talked about. Not all of them are being very well implemented and used at scale. And so that's one of the things that really needs to happen. Okay, well, maybe we'll, I'll put a pin in that and we'll come <laughs> back to it because it has come up a couple of times uh, today and it'd be good to, to go deeper on some of these things and get other perspectives. But I, I wanted to um, get your take, guys, on um, big consequential policies that have passed in the places where you work. You know, I'm thinking about the EU Green Deal, the IRA, um, and uh, China's Carbon Emission Reduction Roadmap uh, is one I'm not that familiar with, but I'm curious to hear, hear a bit more. Sure. Um, yeah, when we talk about like, uh, China Carbon Emission uh, Roadmap, I, I've already said this is almost uh, government driven. So it started with the PBOC, the Central Bank of China. Uh, formed the Green Finance Committee uh, in about 2016. And uh, also, obviously, the president made a commitment. And uh, um, we need to first, I think, understand the context of this market. So about at least 50% of the carbon emission comes from state-owned enterprises in China. And uh, state-owned enterprises in China also own about 95% of the coal assets. So when we talk about carbon emission in China, we have to think about how do we actually 
looked at from the SOE's perspective and how do we, as an investor, how do we engage with SOE's on these issues. Um, SOE's in China are mostly, their, their actions uh, are based on the five-year plan, so we are now on the 14th five-year plan. Um, both the 14th five-year plan and the, the Vision 2035 uh, from the central government uh, actually put uh, binding commitment that they want to decrease the carbon emission by, per unit of GDP by 18% uh, by 2025 compared to 2020. And uh, also, um, all the provinces of China have already addressed uh, climate risk in their 14th five year plan, uh, respectively, and with specific targets. So that is how this whole, whole um, roadmap is integrated into different levels uh, of the governments and also different levels of uh, business sectors. Um, other thing I want to say is actually the carbon emission reduction plan in China started much earlier than uh, many would, uh, would agree because uh, in 2011, uh, October, China already started to pilot uh, the local carbon emission trading schemes in seven major cities, including Shanghai and Beijing. And uh, in 2013, they started online trading uh, of the carbon emissions through those platforms. And uh, nowadays, it covers about 3,000 uh, high emitters in, in the cement, power, and uh, steel sectors. Also, from 2016 to 2020, China actually issued about 16 mandatory uh, standards on energy consumption limit, which I think saved uh, around the, the stats I, I read, saved around annual energy saving about 77 million uh, standard coal. And also, during that period, there was another six. Uh, 26 mandatory rules on product and the equipment uh, carbon emission efficiency. Um, so it's also saved around the uh, annual save around 49 billion uh, kilowatt hour of electricity. All that I think is also uh, working to now we are in the 2023 and uh, two years uh, from the interim target. So I think China is definitely working towards uh, what they are. Agreed, agreed and also committed publicly a couple of years ago. Uh, another thing I think I wanted to say is China also is doing a lot on the uh, engagement with, uh, with different stakeholders. Uh, investor, investor community, for example, uh, has, we have been start, starting to hear more and more collective engagement with Chinese SOEs on this issue since 2018. Uh, partially driven by the MSCI Asia inclusion decision, but also partially driven by more, more and more European and also US uh, investors care about uh, ESG and also care about uh, sustainability of the market. Um, so, so far I think it's still pretty much policy driven, but we have seen, started to see some bottom up uh, behavior from the companies as well to drive these issues. The EU or or the American IRA? When yeah, I, I, I can uh, I can go and briefly talk about IRA, but I'm I, I'm sure most people in this room know IRA better than I do at this point. But I want to give a couple of anecdotes of maybe how IRA has changed some of the conversations that I've been hearing and, and seeing in DC. Um, you know, of course there there was an attempt last week or the week before to. to uh, withdraw some of the funds from IRA in the budget negotiation deal that, that didn't make it through into the final. Um, and I think that was an interesting and confusing <laughs> addition to that budget deal because uh, immediately after IRA passed, there was a, a Bloomberg study that most of the funding in IRA would go to Republican-controlled districts uh, across the states. And so you are starting to see uh, Republican governors going to COP. Uh, and going to conferences just like this one and saying, we are the place to invest. Um, one of my colleagues was uh, at an event with the governor of Alaska just the other week, uh, talking about the exact same things in different ways, but, was, but talking about the energy transition. Um, and then one thing really stuck out to me. So uh, the Department of Labor um, proposed, uh, re proposed re rewrote a rule that clarified what private pension funds can how private pension funds can consider ESG back uh, in their investment. Um, and uh, there was a Congressional Review Act attempt, an attempt to essentially strike down that, that rulemaking in Congress. Um, and when it got to the Senate for consideration, you had seven or eight Senate Democrats on the floor talking about free markets, 
saying, let the free markets work. Don't interfere in uh, investments in the free market. And they were talking about renewables. Um, but it was just so, I, I never tweet, but I actually tweeted, <laughs> everyone should be watching the Senate floor right now because Democrats are now making the free market argument. What topsy-turvy, upside-down world are we in? And I think we're going to see this. We've seen some of this in some of the, the House hearings on ESG so far. I think we will see a lot more of this uh, in the House hearings to come, where you see Democrats and proponents of responsible investment say, let the free market do its job. Um, and I think a lot of that, that shift comes from the IRA. Uh, and sorry, and, and one other piece. Um, if we're talking about fiduciary duties as well, which I, I hope we, we, we'll talk about the anti-ESG backlash in the States, but if you're talking about fiduciary duties and whether or not investors can consider ESG, uh, look no further than the fact that capital is going to uh, IRA, capital is following the IRA. And so if an investor says, oh, we can't think about climate change, that's kind of a wild idea at this point in time. Maybe just maybe just on um, for for all of these for all of these kind of broad arching policy that they're umbrella terms. So they, there's a collection of different policies and interventions, and they all interact with a lot of the other supporting infrastructure, which may or may not be in place. If we take the Green Deal, it's like lots of different bits of the Green Deal: the renovation wave in terms of energy efficiency and other kind of bits of infrastructure. Um, but you've got the European Investment Bank. You've got whatever the European Central Bank can do. So there's there's lots of different kind of uh, uh, elements which can either all kind of create the right conditions for investment or, or in specific areas, just not quite. So in, re in mature renewable energy technology in Europe right now, there is not an access to finance question. It's, it's not a problem. I mean, for the last 10 years in Germany, it's like uh, you could walk into a bank if you had planning for a, for a wind or solar plant, um, three weeks, a facility letter, 100 basis points margin. It's quicker and cheaper than a mortgage, probably. I mean, it's, it's, it's been that way. However, doing the more granular sort of stuff in terms of energy vehicle inf charging infrastructure, you know, energy efficiency, retro, all of those kind of things, not quite, getting, not quite getting the support. And there's often, it's the, a chain is as strong as its weakest link. So you either hit grid into interconnection queue or you hit there's not the people to do the installation or yeah the market price just doesn't quite make sense for the consumer what you do see i think has been useful in the uk is an institution called the green finance institute they've they've been corralling so they're funded by the treasury but they're corralling financial institution and market players they've got things like coalition of energy efficient buildings which is trying to kind of pilot new schemes try to get um trying to kind of develop new kind of uh, business models and then show what's possible in order to kind of create a pathway for, for policy. But it's under, you know, it's, it's under kind of, again, all of the kind of the politics, but for headlines, I mean, the UK came out with a 10 point plan, 12 billion for green. Two weeks later, the road building uh, budget was like three times more. So it, everything, it's, it's like, you can't just separate, you can't just separate out the green policy and call it the green policy. It has to be looked at uh, in the round with all the other infrastructure. Bridget, do you want to chime in on anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a huge amount of intel on the kind of European policy environment, other than to say, you know, if Europe's one case of the number of regulations you have in place isn't necessarily a, <laughs> a KPI, a right? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, of regulations going on, and they don't always interact particularly well with each other. There is a, there's a kind of, they really want them to. Um, but they, there is you know, a huge suite of regulations targeting you know, industry, kind of indirect response to the IRA through the Net Zero Industry Act. There's kind of trade, on, and we'll talk about that. There's kind of minerals, and what are we going to do with this minerals boom, et cetera. So, and then you've got like disclosure regulations specifically relating to fi finance. So there's kind of a real kind of pool of regulations all trying to target mm. kind of different parts of the ecosystem. I think, I don't know if I should open the can of worms, but I'm going to open it anyway. Um, something that's kind of niggling at me as something that I'm worried about in this kind of let's bring all the green jobs here discussion, right? You know, there's, you know, Europe wants all the green jobs in Europe, US wants all the green jobs in US, China wants all the green jobs in China. And for all the emerging and developed economies, which are going to lose all their coal jobs, they're not going to be able to have those budgets to incentivize all the green jobs there. 
And so that is, when we're talking about kind of just energy transitions, that was, is what keeps me awake at night, trying to think about all those solar panels are not going to be manufactured in South Africa, in Indonesia, etc. And that, that's something that keeps me up, but I, I'll, I'll leave that can of worms. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that can. Um, well, let's open it a little bit further, maybe look at it with a, from a different angle. Um, so well, a couple of you have done investing in, um, in developing markets. Uh, so how, uh, what are the bottlenecks to actually finding projects and moving capital to developing markets? Can you talk about that, maybe Nana and, and James, if you have something to say? Sure. Um, so, I mean, investing in developing markets, not just the finance, green finance part, uh, has some general challenges. For example, transparency, I think, being one of the key hurdles, I think, for many investors uh, from foreign markets. And then also, related to that, also data and, uh, and the information gathering, uh, because you don't, if you don't have, like, on the ground team, and you have really channels to, to gather uh, resources, then it's difficult for you to really understand what's the context and also what is going on in this market. Um, also related to that, you have uh, culture and language barriers uh, that is also troubling you to understand the market better. Then these days also there's more and more discussions on liquidity and also political issues uh, related to that. Uh, as an investor, definitely set you back uh, from making some of the uh, investments. Related to green finance, I think there's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, still there's a huge amount of greenwashing happening, I think, in developing markets uh, due to the lack of consistency in, in terms of standards. And also there's, uh, in some cases, I think, uh, companies as well as investors actually contributed to that uh, because they are all rushing into this ESG or green finance space uh, without really having enough resources, I think, to study uh, many of the projects or uh, opportunities uh, deep enough. Um, the lack of transparency also troubled investors from tracking uh, their investments after uh, they financed the projects. So if we cannot have an effective monitoring scheme, then also it's going to be difficult for investors, I think, to, uh, in some cases, to have confidence in, in the projects they want to invest in. Also, it's very uh, realistically speaking, for markets like China, for private capital, it's just uh, for some of the green finance projects, uh, it's just not available to private capital. I mean, it's quite state dominant, I think, uh, field uh, in terms of green projects. So for foreign investors as well as private investors, it's just difficult for you to actually get a hand on uh, quite a lot of uh, projects that in some sensitive industries or some sensitive sectors uh, for you to be a part of the, the discussion. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Much as that, I mean, let's take it broader than just developing economies, but like any any market where it's it's you haven't got all the the pieces of the puzzle. Finance, if you're going to finance something new, it's about you need to have all the pieces of the puzzle in place. And the more it's either an emerging technology or an emerging market, there's maybe more pieces missing. So in order to get something done in the real economy, it means you're going to have a higher transaction cost because you're going to have to figure those bits out. Um, there's going to be political risk, there's management, competencies, stakeholders, finance, and maybe currency risk, all of those kind of bits. So it's going, to be, it's going to be harder to get started. So again, it's one of those things of how are you going to make the investment in being able to figure that stuff out to be able to maybe kind of get a, a, a pipeline of projects to be able to develop it rather than saying, I'm just going to waste, if you're a secondary investor, you're just waiting for that to kind of emerge from somewhere. And then you say, oh, we like that. We can, we can do it. Um, the one thing which because it came up about managing risk is that, so risk isn't, isn't like a constant function. Risk is, an, is, is a function of your understanding and your proximity. If you're a long way away from it, either from the technology or from the country, then it all looks kind of a bit exotic and weird. And I haven't seen that before. And well, I'm not sure if I trust it. If you're on the ground, you can work out how to manage things. You can work out which are the ways that we can kind of deal with this. That's how you can add value as finance. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, that's the hard yards. And unless you've got people in finance who can actually do that, then you're not going to get new finance for new things. It will be a long time waiting. And a lot of the, a lot of the kind of the, the finance flows and commitments 
um, uh, are sitting there waiting for the mature projects and they're not able to even recognize the small projects which are coming about. Even, I mean, impacts, which I, I think is one of the best investors, I should just say, but I mean, I noted, I mean, Ian Sim, the CEO said, it's like the problem is there's not the deals around. But a lot of these things, if you, if you see kind of a, a, a jigsaw box with like loads of pieces strewn around, you might not recognize it as something. No. Um, you need to get in, you need to roll your sleeves up, you need to be able to kind of figure out how to put those things together in order for those markets to be created. And that's hard work. Um, and there are some technical assistance facilities from the MDBs we've mentioned about that, and the people putting stuff together, but there are so many of the SDGs where there is just no finance flow, and yet there's a surfeit of, of money looking for the mature uh, projects, and, and it can't all find a home. Yeah, well, I was looking in the audience to see if I could find uh, Kanika from Sustainable Energy for All. She talked about these boundary conditions, you know, that there's all this capital, and then it, it gets stuck because of boundary conditions, and she didn't clarify what those were. And I think maybe some of this. Well, well just, I mean, a bankable and investable that's a, that's a flexible boundary. It's not, it wasn't written in a tablet of stone which kind of came down to planet Earth. It's like it is something which we make as a, as a judgment as people in the finance industry every day. It's like when I was doing wind in the late 90s, it was not bankable. We were banking it. It became bankable. It's now it's like it's so boring I can't even get close to it because it's just too <laughs> dull. But it's just like, this is a flexible boundary. We, we create that reality. That's how, that's how finance can and should be adding value. Okay, now for the, the advocates out there for civil society, what are they supposed to do to help you guys get your act together? I mean. Oh. <laughs> well, you described uh, this problem, uh, right? And uh, so is it like, uh, I don't know, is it? Meaning, is it, what, how, would, how would you approach the problem? If you're on the outside. I, 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 I have to just say, um, yeah, I recognize our, our CEO's commitment, but uh, uh, our company, this is our 25th anniversary. So we've been doing quite a lot of investments in the past already. So I think the context of his com com uh, comment was, uh, we, we have done quite a, lot, quite a few rounds actually of investment in sustainable uh, related business. And uh, it comes to a point that we need to find some new targets. And uh, I think, it's, and also, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, peers co coming into this space. So I think it's about uh, finding the general uh, green projects is, is becoming, become more and more difficult. Um, and uh, comes back to this, this discussion, I think, yeah, training is definitely very important. I think for, as I said, I think for finance industry, there's actually, the reality is the finance industry needs more time and uh, specialties to be able to really tell and select uh, among different projects they have. And uh, fail to do that, I think, has really contributed to the greenwashing uh, in different mm. markets. Um, how do you, like as a, finance, like as, a, as a manager, how do you tackle this? Uh, has a lot to say about your culture and also of what, what is the commitment and also what is the real um, Go we here for you? Uh, is it PR? Is it sales? Is it really you, you believe this in your philosophy? I think it makes a very different uh, phenomena. And uh, in markets like Asia, we are so early stage, so I think it's still very difficult for investors, for all investors, for example, to tell uh, which manager is, is genuine, which is credible to do that. So I think it takes time to really, for also other stakeholders to, to make that uh, argument. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking of New Energy Nexus, who we heard from, you know, what a great example of doing that incubating, making those connections, making these deals real. Um, but that operates at a scale, you know, it's maybe a smaller scale than um, some of the big projects that need to happen. And, and maybe that's, uh, that's where there's a gap. But, but, but maybe as well, I think it's a, it's a subtle thing, but maybe we need to change the metrics of success so it's not just scale. Because a lot of the scale isn't necessarily transformative, and that's difficult. Um, the, the real outcomes are going to be people who can change the game and create the pathways for new things to happen. Uh, it's not just kind of managing the kind of the, the volumes of allocation. You know, at the moment, the biggest thing, I mean, and we had it in the other panels, is like getting a lot of finance out of the problem, and there's still kind of money going into the problem. Why is it going into the problem? Why would banks still be financing fossil fuels? because they're good at managing risk and they found ways to be able to socialize the risk. 
you know, they know, they've calculated ways of being able to, that it's not going to be hitting them as much as it's going to be hitting other people. So that becomes the priority first. But in the way that Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone, we found better things to do. We need to figure out who's going to help find the better things to do and make that a transformation. And, and, and it's not about measuring the, the financial inputs. How many billion did you put out? But what is it that you did was transformational that's really going to leverage in um, private finance if you're an MDB or create new markets if you're, if you're, a, you know, if you're a bank or investor? So you're getting, oh, you're getting into, going here, okay, my mic working. So you're getting into uh, the topic of how you measure whether we're being successful and how you measure progress. And I wanted to ask you guys, since you've all been thinking about uh, this for years, do you have a favorite metric or indicator that you want to share with the group and how you measure progress in moving capital to clean? I have two. Can I have two? Yeah, you can have two. So the first one uh, is 1,000. So PRI has a regu regulation database. We track all uh, what we consider um, supportive responsible investment policies around the world. Uh, and that number has been growing near exponentially. I think it's about to hit 1,000. Um, so that is policies designed. I think about 60% or so of those are disclosure, um, so corporate disclosure. Uh, next, it's investor disclosure. Next, we get into some shareholder rights, and then we get into some taxonomies. Um, and watching the growth and the trajectory of that, you can sort of see this evolution uh, of what do investors need to actually do these things, to, to make responsible investments, to be responsible investors. And we can sort of see it by how that regulatory uh, sphere is growing. Um, and so it, it looks like those priorities seem clear, right? You need information, and then you need uh, to be transparent, as Nana said. And then you need to know, how are we measuring good and, good and bad? Uh, and then the other metric I was going to say, um, just a quick plug, and, and maybe we'll talk about this later, is 85%. And that's the number of anti-ESG bills that were introduced in states in the US this year that failed. Um, and uh, highlighted in a report uh, out this morning uh, by Frances Sawyer, who's here somewhere, uh, and her team at Pleiades Strategies. So um, that's another metric for today. Anyone else? Have, and I'm going to pick okay. on you last, Bridget, because I think maybe sure. we should talk about taxonomies. And, sure. Yeah. yeah. Any, anything else you'd add? I mean, <clears throat> despite being um, a recovering mathematician, I think that be, measures are difficult. I mean, this is a good heart's law. Is the minute you create a measure, it becomes useless because people will game it, and they'll game it all the time in finance. Um, we, we put out a report about um, hitting the target, missing the point. Um, because w what you see already, and we came up in the last panel, you're seeing, you're seeing financial institutions putting out policies, so they're getting the policy ticks in the box, and then do you, do you actually follow your own policy? Well, no one's going to look at that. Um, I think that what would, be, what would be a good indicator would be having stakeholder panels to set up to, to look at what uh, financial institutions are doing and say, how much of this um, is really optimum in terms of being able to achieve SDGs or, or, or some kind of reference, um, you know, which is going to be different compared to which corner of the world you're in and what the specific bit of the business and what type of uh, financial institution you are. But I think that, that you can't necessarily have one cookie cutter methodology which then scores something as the, the, the holy grail measure. And I think it, it creates a lot of problems when, when one searches for it. So you don't like the four to one ratio, capital going to I actually, I mean, I think it's useful as a sort of a, as a discussion kind of tool. And it's, it's, it's great to be able to kind of share. I, wouldn't in, I think it would be really dangerous to fully institutionalize it, yeah. to be honest. Because, uh, because again, um, what it doesn't show is within the four, which we're a long, long way away, which is why it's useful as a tool right now, because we're nowhere, I mean, it's like nowhere near four to one. Um, it's one to one. It's, 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 well, it's about one to one. Um, which is kind of a big deal. I mean, that's new. It's, it's, it depends which, way, which direction you're looking, backwards or forwards. Um, 
but it's, it doesn't show within the four which bits of the four need to happen, which are the enabling technologies, business model approaches, which is going to actually allow us to get all the way there. Because if everybody wants to do the same bit of the four, it doesn't work. It will not get us to where we need to go. And then all the boffins who calculated the four to one in the first place will go, oh, no, actually, we need to change the ratios. That, that's, the, that's the kind of the point. We need, to, we need to think of it more in that kind of context. So do you want to talk about taxonomies in, the, in this context and yeah, I'm what they are and how many there are and what they're for and why they were created? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll quickly go on my favorite numbers. Uh, okay. So we track the green bond market. So there's, I don't know, I've lost count. There's a lot of green bonds, um, <laughs> <laughs> the trillions and whatever. Um, I think the, there's a lot of failings to the green bond market. No, we won't go into that now. But there are some real kind of positives in the trillions. Um, and that is kind of scale is important in and of itself because um, so scale creates liquidity and it can get kind of deals off bank books and recycle capital. So that's really, really important. So banks make a loan to a renewable energy project and they can get rid of it really easily because everybody wants to buy green bonds and then they can make more of those loans. If they make a loan to something that's hard to get rid of, they can't recycle that capital easily. So that's kind of the, the theory of change around green bonds. It's not just kind of like, you know, this sort of kind of really badly labeled kind of boring financial instrument. And that's kind of part, and that is sort of working. And, and, you know, there's lots of green bonds that aren't particularly green. We screen out about 25% of all issuance for stuff that we don't think passes the muster. And that doesn't go through to indices and all that kind of thing. So I think there are kind of some checks and balances in place. But um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, taxonomy. So a lot of my work um, is advising kind of governments and, and regulators on how they define green. And so taxonomies kind of grew out of the green bond market. So if you, the green bond market started as quite a specific tool. So you, you've got a bond and it's going to finance a wind turbine. When I started in this, it was so great because I had been in equities before and had spent a lot of time trying to kind of figure out these quite meaningless metrics for what is more sustainable than another. And I found it like very intangible. And the green bond market was quite nice because you had something that was financing something else. So then if you have something that's being financed, what, what should be financed and what is green? And that's kind of how the taxonomy world grew out of quite a specific need to draw a line in the sand and say everything on that side you can finance and everything on the other side you can't. Um, and so that's kind of where they grew out of, but they've, they've created a monster, right, of their own. And now we've got uh, somebody told me 40 the other day, but I don't Small. think I don't have 40 on my spreadsheet. But anyway, um, 40 in development or in rumors or in place um, that are around and about governments that have looked at quite a sophisticated system for defining what is green. Why is it kind of different to what's gone before? Well, there's a kind of few key things. The one is that at least on the outset, they're intended to be science based. So that is quite different. So not policy-based, but science-based. Now, there's criticisms and all of that, but that is the intention of most of them. So that's quite good. The other is that they're way more granular than we originally thought. So when the EU started developing its taxonomy, we thought it was going to be kind of quite high-level, sort of vague principles. But it's actually very specific about what you can and can't call green. So that was so really granular. And the last is um, quite kind of public. So they're not all developed by public institutions, but the methodology and information is all there for you to read. So it's not a black box methodology somewhere that's quite opaque. It's all kind of there. So I think those three things have made this kind of taxonomy space a little bit different and quite new. And we've seen a lot of governments kind of looking at, uh, and, and non-governments, so we've seen uh, private sector institutions come together, um, like we saw in Australia, to try and kind of come up with a, a common framework for thinking about what is green. Um, you know, we can, there's, there's lots of, uh, you know, downsides to this, but I think this is kind of a real attribute that we're actually trying to find quite specific, define quite specifically what we mean by what can be called green and that. It is worth distinguishing between the taxonomy regulation and the taxonomy as a set of definitions. So the EU has taken that into regulation and that has kind of grown a life of its own. But in most countries, it, it's a set of definitions and they're probably going to be voluntary in the short term. So there, there are kind of differences there. Um, 
I'll, I'll stop there, but yeah. But so wh why does the EU green taxonomy count uh, gas uh, plants that gener for electricity <laughs> as green, for instance? So <laughs> let me take you the process, through the process of the filthy world of politics. Um, <laughs> so the EU taxonomy <laughs> was de <laughs> developed. Yeah, I'll stop. <clears throat> developed by a group of experts, mostly from kind of academia, etc. They put forward a set of recommendations, which was then adopted and not adopted by the by the European kind of politic parliament and the and the kind of political system. So at some point, the set of, set of definitions was handed over, right? And then it things got a little murky. So in that process, uh, there was a big kind of fight around gas, which clearly was not given over as green as part of the original set of definitions from academia and the likes. Um, and a big kind of fight went on, unfortunately, just before the Ukraine war, because I do come quite strongly believe that if this had happened afterwards, um, we, we wouldn't have, it wouldn't have even been a debate. But anyway, let's <coughs> not go into that. Um, so, what happened was the gas lobby woke up, right? Which we were really sad about because we were trying to keep everything very under the radar. Um, and then uh, it looked like it was going to be very difficult to get loans. And so everybody woke up and got into a frenzy. So the, the kind of very strange position they came to is that gas is not defined as green under the EU taxonomy. It's defined as transitional. There is nothing else in the EU taxonomy defined as transitional, just this one carve out, right? And it actually has quite strong caveats to the point that probably nothing will get defined as transitional under the EU taxonomy. But the real, real problem and like what brought me to tears by the whole process was that the headlines are more important than the details. And a lot of other countries read that as the EU calls gas green. Nothing will, get, nothing will get through the caveats in the EU system, such as they were put forward, but no one else has read the caveats. So that's, the, that's, the, that's where we landed. But um, it's not ideal, but at the same time, we're not going to see really all that much get, gas get off the ground in the EU because of those caveats. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, that, that's how yeah, we ended up in that position. I think everybody in the room feels a lot better. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so does anyone else have a comment on, on these, the usefulness of taxonomies? And but yeah. just one little add-on, which is, in a way, I think, where the, where the fossil fuel lobby as well was slightly involved in, in framing the, date, the debate right at the beginning for it being a narrow green taxonomy. Because it's just like, right, let's get all the people who want to do the green ESGs, so let's have them running around, going through definitions, doing disclosures, having to do all this sort of stuff. What about the unsustainable? Where's, where's the polluting taxonomy? You want to tackle sustainability, regulation is better at stopping things. You should, have had, you should have started the other end, you know, because most people who are doing the non-green stuff, they go, yeah, there's this, this a problem. No, we can, we, we can just walk on by here. And, and that's the thing which is being replicated whatever 40x times. And, and that feels like right at the beginning, it kind of set off on a, on a wrong course. And people are talking about, well, there needs to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these additional taxonomies. But again, it wouldn't have even been that hard because we know much more clearly from the science what it is that doesn't fit compared to things which, which definitely do fit. And the things which definitely do fit, if the transition works out, there's going to be a ton of entrepreneurialism, a ton of innovation. It's going to change all the time. So it's going to be a constantly dynamic process, which means a lot of costs, a lot of changing regulations, a lot of instability, which finance institutions don't tend to like. So whereas the, with the stuff that doesn't fit, we just know it's not going to fit and it's not going to fit. It's like it's not like coal's going to go, oh, yeah, no, we figured it out. That's going to be all right again. That, that's kind of that that's kind of uh, already sealed. And that would that's mm. already spun us in the wrong direction in a way. That's a very interesting perspective. Like maybe we should have developed uh, a set of rules on all the bad things that we shouldn't allow. Which is in discussion. Yeah. yeah, which is a red taxonomy is what they're calling it. Yeah. And that's what that is, is a red, red. Red, red taxonomy for yeah. all, the, all the stuff that you shouldn't invest in. So we've touched on, uh, on ESG and, and greenwashing a little bit, and there's a lot of greenwashing that needs to be called out. And in, the, in the US, um, especially, we've seen this anti-ESG wave. Uh, that's in part about promoting oil and gas interests and punishing companies who are striving to reduce emissions. Um, but I was curious, Greg, if you 
you had some thoughts on this and you know, what you're seeing in Washington and, and hearing from your investor partners. Um, what's the impact of this? Yeah, it's, it's been an interesting, I guess, six months or legislative season in the US. Um, and I love this, this line where you said, no one read the caveats. So I think I'll, I'll go there where, you know, no one read these bills. And then once they did read these bills, they said, oh, these are, these are not what we want. Uh, and so we saw 165 bills deemed anti-ESG for, for whatever reason um, introduced across 37 different states. Uh, they went through the legislative process. You know, uh, you could say that a lot of bills get introduced and, and are never passed uh, or never considered. These bills were introduced with the intent to pass with a, 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 you know, a coordinated strategy to, to get these bills in as many states as possible. Um, and there were dozens of hearings uh, and hours and hours spent on these bills. And it turns out that bankers didn't like these bills. Uh, chambers of Commerce didn't like these bills. Of course, environmentalists didn't like these bills. But then even like some oil and gas executives didn't like these bills. Uh, the pension managers didn't like the bills. Uh, the state securities administrators didn't like the bills. So, so no one who read the bill and knew what the bills were going to do liked, liked the bills. Um, and so that's why we saw 140 plus of these die or not get passed. We did see 22 uh, new pieces of legislation across uh, thir 14 different states. Four states had... 50% of those bills. So uh, Arkansas had four bills, Utah and Kansas had three, and uh, or Utah and Florida had three, and, and Texas had two. Um, and then there's a, a pocket of a handful of other bills. Uh, but the, the main conclusion is that these bills really didn't come from a genuine interest from industry, from investors to say, hey, we need some clarity here, or there's something wrong here that we're trying to fix. Um, it was pretty clear that, that all of this legislation came from a place of, you know, call it disingenuous efforts to stymie progress that's been made on being more responsible investors, taking into account uh, material information and trying to narrow that universe. Um, and I think there was a pretty resounding uh, no from across the various states. That doesn't mean that this effort's going to go away for next year or even similar bills at the federal level in, con level in Congress that will probably get considered sometime next month. Um, but it is pretty clear from folks who have read all of the caveats in the bills is that uh, these don't do what you want them to do. And in fact, they are going to cost uh, retirees and pensions that you're trying to protect, allegedly, some money um, if you do actually pass these bills. Uh, so is there a chance that these spread to these ideas spread to other markets? Seeing any of that if you're working outside the US? Or Greg, if you Yeah, I, I mean I I can say what we've done some looking. Uh, and this also came right at the tail end of uh, we did a global consultation about PRI in a changing world. Uh, we spoke to more than a thousand of our signatories and nowhere else other than this, these markets in the US said anything but we're moving forward on responsible investment. We're moving forward on ESG integration. We're moving forward on the transition in whatever way that looks like in your market. Um, I've heard some, from some of my colleagues in Australia or um, some pieces in the EU, but nothing that looks similar to this. So curious if, if the others have seen something that looks like we don't like ESG integration as, a, as an idea. I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily the legislation that is going to come in, but the fear has already spread. So I, I speak to lots of bankers that do exec education and things like that. Bankers aren't allowed to use WhatsApp. They're not allowed to post in the chat on Teams. They are not allowed to make public statements. They're not allowed to put stuff on social media without it being signed off. There is really like a, it's like careful what you say, everybody, and best, if in doubt, say nothing. There's, there will be clamping down on greenwashing. There's an interesting, there's a UK piece of legislation, uh, it's consumer digital finance or something, which you wouldn't expect to see it, but, but misleading the public in digital markets, which will include uh, greenwashing, will have some real teeth because at the moment it's kind of being, well, you did a bit of misadvertising. Here's how you should have done it. Go correct it. 
That's not really a penalty. Um, a fine of up to 1% of global turnover, that's a penalty. Um, that's going to change your day. But, but what you see with the polarization is just like, you're getting people saying greenwashing, that's, you know, you're, you're doing something which is in some ways misinforming, it's disingenuous. And the other side is saying, well, you're misinformation too, and we don't believe you. And with AI multiplying the polarization, it's just like, we, we're going to get into this kind of uh, stalemate situation. Um, and what happened with the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, I should say, because I got involved a little bit with that through, through GFAN's advisory, is that you got the Attorney General's calling out collaboration between insurers. But actually, in, the, in those states, you've sort of seen all the insurers are now pulling out and communities and families are losing insurance. It was the most pyrrhic victory um, that they've kind of scored there because insurance is all about collaboration. It's about risk pooling. It's just like, and we need like the Competition Markets Authority and I think in the UK and in, in Europe, they're now kind of looking at, we need specific legislation to say antitrust and competition, it doesn't apply in this case because this isn't about ganging up on consumers. It's about the necessary collaboration in order to make people safe. So we need, we probably need a much stronger voice from the financial community, which I think the civil society groups should be helping on to say, call that out. We need to change the antitrust laws. It's because this is, this is, this is the BS was like, this is not about gang up. There are real reasons why it was important when first introduced, but this was not the use case. Um, for it, so it needs to it needs to be turned over. Well, and, and and maybe this you know these are sort of two separate things, right? Greenwashing is a real thing, and then this anti ESG backlash are, are real things. But there have been regulatory efforts to address greenwashing, right? You have SFDR in Europe. You have something very similar, remarkably similar in the UK, and that the SECs proposed. Uh, so so there's credible credible efforts to address greenwashing, and then you have this not so credible attack on whatever it is but can some good come from this attack well if people say well maybe we made this claim and now we are being forced to back up that claim maybe we shouldn't have made that claim maybe some good will come from this in the long run where everyone says yeah we should make sure that we are clear about what we're saying and we're clear about what we're doing uh and you know that's part of the trajectory of as i see responsible investment from infancy to messy yeah. adolescence, whatever it is, before we can get, get to the next stage. So, I mean, it, it, it's not fun and it's bumpy, but maybe it was a necessary uh, step for as inauthentic as some of the attacks mm. are and were. What about in China? Yeah, I think on this topic, um, I remember last month I had a call with uh, Australian Superannuation Council for Superannuation Investors, or XE, and uh, they were talking about there's a new term coming uh, from Australia called Green Hushin which is now uh, quite a few large caps, they have started to actually turn down or, or withdraw their commitment on their website for uh, climate actions or net zero roadmaps uh, because they're too afraid of potential legal actions looking at uh, US and EU. So definitely that is having some deterrent effect around the, among other um, players. For Asia in general, I think it's not yet anti-ESG uh, because we never really on board <laughs> Uh, fully. <laughs> so I think it's still at a stage of ESG reluctance. Um, still the discussions are mostly on why should we care about ESG and how it's going to do with our returns. So it's still at that stage. Um, I, I'm sure at some point when we have more mainstream uh, ESG strategies and also funds, etc., we will also come with some resistance from uh, some players in the market about anti-ESG. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Do any of you want to talk about uh, the importance of banking and investor alliances focused on reducing emissions? You mentioned defense, insurance collaboration. Um, so uh, the Glasgow Financial, what does it stand for? Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero. For Net Zero, um, yeah. I think that, I mean, and why don't I hear other kind of people on this, but it's like, I think voluntary initiatives, again, broad umbrella, what's the usefulness of a voluntary initiative? Well, it's not, regulators can set floors. They can say, you know what, everybody, you can't be doing those things anymore. If you're doing those things that you're not allowed. So they're good at sort of like policing the floor, the minimum criteria. A voluntary initiative should be about driving the ambition. It should be a race to the top. It should be throwing the spotlight on the leaders. 
What you've actually got though in a lot of the net zero alliances is a kind of a threshold criteria in order to get as many institutions in as possible. And most of the attention is, oh yeah, well they might leave, so maybe they might go, oh no, are they gonna leave? So you've actually got, you've actually got kind of the, the kind of the, 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 the micro drama of like what's happening at the floor. And there isn't really a huge amount of pressure in terms of, well, how are you kind of out, how are the, the next one gonna sort of outshine the others in, in competing on sustainability? So I think that GFANS is in a bit of a crisis. I think that voluntary initiatives can really work, but they need to, but they can only work if they're a race to the top. And if they can, by being a race to the top and shift the norm, very quickly say, right, there's enough of us now who are doing that, regulators, come and make that, come and make that sort of the, the floor that everybody needs to jump and then you raise the baseline. That's the theory of change for voluntary initiatives. And I think that, that it, it's taken a bit of a wrong turn, but, but it needs to be, you know, they're always going to be reinvented. So it needs to reinvent itself like round about now. So GFANS had, they had a, a requirement for fossil fuel phase out. I think they were ratcheting it up, what I read, and then they, that's what they're talking about. Well, there was a challenge from race to zero because they were in race to zero, race to zero, trying to impose it. And then the GFANS membership through the alliances said, oh, we're not sure about that. There's now an even bigger gauntlet thrown on the on the floor, which is from the uh, Net Zero Expert Group from from uh, Secretary General Guterres, um, chaired by Catherine McKenna, and it's just like, right, well, that's out there. I mean, that from a campaign's perspective as well, that's where that's where the bar should be, mm -hmm. and we should be seeing financial institutions going, right? How do we get to that? How do we get as close to that? How do we get the race to that top as soon as possible? Um, but you know that's not currently the, the debate within the alliance. It's not what's coming out of uh, the different alliances because they're worried about oh if we try and if we try and turn up the heat on everybody then we're going to lose people at the at the bottom. So it's it's all about the uh, yeah the, the policing the threshold. I think where I have seen kind of some kind of positive developments in that kind of alliance and voluntary initiative space. So I'm having a lot of discussions where they've come together and gone. Uh, how do we do this, right? And kind of thinking about that dirty word transition. How do we kind of transition our portfolios and how do we get away from thinking about kind of carbon footprinting, which is the most kind of useless metric anybody's ever come up with, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it, 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 where you just trade in and out of stocks is kind of totally meaningless, right? And so they, and I've had some really good discussions with a lot of the voluntary groups to think, okay, what does actually transition mean? And I'm going to put aside kind of fossil fuel divestment and that side of things, because that is, you know, polarizing, et cetera. But then thinking about kind of what does transition mean in kind of industry sectors where we know we still need the sector, right? It's not a transition away. It's not a, it's not a phase out, a phase down. It's a kind of complete change. And so how do we kind of measure that? How do we monitor that in a kind of in a long game, right? Because it's not, it's not going to happen in two to three years. And then how do we think about some of these technologies we've been speaking about in the last two days, like CCS, like hydrogen, blue, green, pink, whatever. And so I think where I found them quite valuable is that some of those discussions, you, you, people come to the table going, oh yeah, but of course CCS, you know, that's gonna be a huge lever. And you go, well, it's not because of X, Y, and Z. It might be in these niche sectors, but not here. And they go, oh, okay, that's interesting. Do you know what I mean? So I found that process to be really valuable where people kind of brought along the process of trying to understand a technical space and like all of these different decarbonization levers are quite technical in from a kind of financial, you know, thinking about numbers perspective, right? So I, I think that, look, there's definitely some flaws, but I've seen quite a lot of positive kind of interactions in that. And there, um, some of the kind of GFANs and other kind of key institutions are actually talking together right now about how we do think about transition of industry sectors and, and what of the markers of success. So I think that's been quite useful. I, I go back to something James said earlier about, you know, the, we're creating all these rules for the good stuff. And how much does that slow us down? I mean, do you feel like um, this is a significant, it, it has become a significant break on the flow of the capital clean -in. I'm kind of asking the wrong crowd here. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I can give a perspective. Do you want to come in? I, I'd say, so somebody said to me, somebody said to me, who's in, a, in an ESG department, they said, 
Our department is five times bigger, our workload is 10 times bigger. We don't get to even see the sustainability systemic questions anymore. I think that the reality is that, um, you know, the, 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 the change in the real economy, and I've speaking from a banking and, and sort of primary real economy investment, impact investment kind of background, it's driven by relationship managers and relationship teams. It's not, their day isn't changed so much by the, the, the disclosure reg regulations, apart from the fact that they are now spending more time having to go through and check things off, get more data, take their client through more rigorous processes. Um, so I, it's, it's not an accelerator. I think that in a way, the question is, how is it being internalized by a financial institution? How much are they sort of seeing, right, we're really going to go into this. This is our purpose now. Let's double down and get into these, into these sectors. And how many are kind of just ticking the, the, the box? Mm. Also, how much of them are really absorbing it from a, of an impact purpose perspective? Because a lot of the other frameworks, ISSB, um, which people are kind of hailing as like, oh, this is the harmonization of everything. It's still a single materiality framework which is about the, how, the, how the outside world impacts you financially. It's not about the reverse so much. So it's not gonna change the way that relationship managers are gonna go out because it's not, gonna, it's not gonna speak to the ultimate purpose of addressing sustainability goals. Hmm. Yeah, may, maybe I'll just say, uh, <clears throat> you know, everyone in the US is waiting anxiously for the SEC's climate disclosure rule. But as James said, that's a, that's a pure single materiality. Uh, we can also have a conversation on single versus double materiality and that, that terminology. But uh, you know, that is just disclosure. That is, for the SEC you know, trying to uh, allay all these fears of regulatory overreach, it is not making anyone do anything. You're just reporting what you're already doing or what you've promised in the public sphere to do. Uh, and so that is step one. And there is a lot more. There are many, many more steps beyond disclosure uh, that need to happen. So um, we wanted to save a lot of time for questions from the audience. So uh, no. Um, so if the mic works, it would be nice to have some questions, we have more, we can keep going here. If anybody wants to um, come in with a question, please step up to the mic. Not... Oh, oh, here comes him. Hi, thanks so much for a fascinating panel. My name is Alec Conn, and I um, work with Stop the Money Pipeline, which is a corporate campaigning coalition focused on the financial industry. And I wanted to ask a question about the anti-ESG. Um, piece. It was really, you know, uh, good to hear about how many of the bills have failed. But I think, from our perspective, the anti-ESG movement has kind of already effectively achieved many of its goals. You know, we've heard from banks that they that fossil fuel exclusion policies are now off the table. We've seen the collapse of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance or the, the virtual collapse, and we've seen BlackRock um, backslide significantly and pretty much de declare fealty to fossil fuels. For, for all eternity. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that we, it's, it's a real mistake to, um, uh, to, un, to, to uh, not really see how big a threat the anti-ESG movement continues to be. And I think we need a very coordinated strategic response. And so I'm curious if the, any of the panelists have thoughts on what is the most effective way for us to push back on the anti-ESG movement? Is it, you know, to give one example, is it um, introducing good bills in blue states and getting good bills passed in a kind of offense as a best, best form of defense kind of strategy? Or are there other um, avenues for us to, to really effectively push back on the anti-ESG piece that, that isn't just fighting policy with communications, which it kind of looks like it has been a little bit up until now? Yeah, I can, I can start. I, I, I do take the point that there has been a chilling effect in the market because of this, right? And, and that is the purpose. Um, but I would say don't give too much credit because the, the foundation of the anti-ESG arguments rest on false presumption of fiduciary duty, which basically, you know, the presumption is you can't consider ESG or you can't consider 
outcomes, right? The impact that your investments have on the planet, uh, because that's not a pecuniary consideration. That is a very narrow and I would say wrong interpretation of fiduciary duties. Uh, you know, we there was a panel over lunch about about Calpers, and uh, one of the people on the panel said, you know, we care about climate change because I need to have a livable. Uh, a livable planet in the future alongside my retirement, right? And those two things go hand in hand, right? So that so those are climate change is arguably pecuniary. So the the foundation of the anti-ESG backlash is based on a false premise. And PRI and others around the world have done 20 plus years of uh, work and discussion and uh, papers with lawyers to prove this out. Um, and so I would say, yes, chilling effect, long-term stopping the transition, no, long-term preventing capital from going uh, to smarter, more responsible places, no. Uh, is it incredibly frustrating? Yes. And do we need to do things to push back? Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have, my, I'm not in the US market very much, so I don't know if I have a huge amount to say. but. I think it's, yeah, it's really tricky because it is founded on a false premise, but so is like the entire climate denial and that's been pretty persistent, right? So we're kind of stuck with these you know, massively false premises that kind of persist for a long time. And a lot of the kind of work we try to do is kind of trying to reframe things around opportunities and not kind of cost. So the, the kind of transition around a low carbon economy is a financial opportunity as more so than it is a cost and it is a hell of a lot less costly than the financial burden that we'll have to bear if you know of climate chaos right so trying to kind of some of these things are the reframing of these particularly around the financial side of things around the kind of, the kind of significant opportunities around investment in the transition and the kind of reduction of long-term risks around that as well now i don't love to get into to kind of discussions around risk, because I think risk can kind of go either way, right? Sometimes it suits you to think about risk and sometimes it doesn't, right? If there's no policy risk at stake, like in some places, then policy is not a risk. And in other, in other jurisdictions, it will be. So I don't love to think about risk too much, but I think there is kind of a lot of, there are kind of a lot of discussions and a lot of, um, you know, central banks have done a lot of work on financial stability and the kind of the, the, the real chaos that will come for our financial system from kind of climate shocks. And I think that really can kind of help us a bit to kind of reframe some of the, the kind of false premises and all of that and kind of step away maybe a bit from that debate and we're really kind of trying to think about what are the big risks we're avoiding and the, and the financial opportunities that, that, um, that can you know, benefit investors. Well, I think for, for, for our part, um, it's not a difficult I mean, question, actually, because the whole story of impacts is we grow from a couple million uh, by investing in investment opportunities, raising from the transition to a more sustainable economy to now probably the largest uh, specialist manager in the world with 50, 50 billion uh, US dollars. So the whole idea is that there is an investment case here, and uh, it is important for investors to also incorporate these issues into their investment decisions. Um, any argument anti this kind of um, philosophy, I think, is just not really solid, I think, for us. So that's one thing. And the other one is, I think, for, I mean, I, again, I don't also work a lot with U.S. market, but we do have uh, U.S. offices here and I also have uh, quite a big team here. Um, I think a lot, a lot of this now anti-ESG uh, discussions, we we are not really trying to address anything. I think um, probably after maybe November next year, it will settle down a lot. So we're just uh, yeah waiting to, to see that. Okay. Hi, I'm David Molly. I'm uh, at UC Berkeley Goldman School, and uh, we're the host of the California Green Bond Market Development Committee. So um, Bridget, uh, CBI has been very helpful to us. And really important leader uh, internationally on, on the emergence of these, these new securities. So 
So what you've seen in Europe is the emergence of a, of a kind of price benefit from green bonds because you get higher participation rates, I think is what's causing the reduction. And, uh, but not, it's not happening so far in the US, at least in the municipal bond market. I think there are some indications in private securities, um, but not in the municipal bond market. So uh, if, if uh, the, my question is, is there an opportunity for states like California, New York, um, <coughs> um, to actually capture uh, higher participation rates away from the great states um, by, um, you know, by doing good disclosure on, uh, on their infrastructure and kind of an opportunity to get lower cost infrastructure if they do good disclosure? Um, currently, even California doesn't do good dis disclosure on its municipal bonds, but they could, and other states could follow that and pull uh, in their direction uh, investment that's being driven out of gray states. I, I mean, it's just a, it's a hypothetical. Uh, no, you're not in the U.S. market, but I just wonder if you had an idea on that. Um, bond pricing is a bit of a dark art, <laughs> um, and it's a dark art I'm not, I, I have to say, I'm not very familiar with the dynamics of bond pricing. One of my colleagues does a lot of that work. Um, but we are seeing some kind of price differentials in very liquid markets uh, around kind of green versus vanilla bonds, and that has come up in the data over and over again. Why we're not seeing it in the muni bond market is not something I'm very familiar with. So it's a, it's a very different market, very different set of investors, much smaller deals, huge volume, etc. So that, you know, might you don't kind of see that same oversubscription levels that you're seeing um, in of other green bonds, which are much bigger deals. So whether there's an opportunity to capture that through good disclosure, I don't know if that is the kind of key differentiator between you know, getting a price benefit or not. I would say it might not be, and there are other factors at play. And a lot of the time, the factors are kind of just supply of green product, however much it's grown over the last few years, and I think that is kind of a lesson for all of us, is that we are not, the demand is way outstripping supply. And, you know, when it came, when we got to 100 billion of green bonds, we thought we might have seen the, you know, demand ceiling. When we got to a trillion, we thought, it, we're nowhere close. Like, there is so much demand. Um, and so that's kind of also why we're seeing the kind of slight differences. The, the market dynamics in different currencies and in the muni markets are all a bit kind of all over the place and it's hard to make an assessment. And so I often say to kind of potential issuers, there's a lot of other benefits you're going to get. Don't kind of get too hung up on pricing, although that is everybody wants to get hung up on pricing. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I think we've, the growth has been kind of really interesting. And I think thinking about the divestment campaigns, I've had a lot of discussions with divestment campaigners over the years as a kind of positive story to the negative. So if you're taking your money out of somewhere, you have to put it somewhere else. And that's kind of been quite a useful kind of growth story as well. Um, and the fact that, you know, bonds are very boring and, <laughs> and, and investors like something that looks like like a bond and walks like a bond and probably is a bond, right? So that is, you know, so something that's quite normal and quite kind of for investors have been incredibly successful. And I think that's um, kind of a lesson on um, kind of more innovative deals have been harder to structure. And I think that's um, something we're looking at more and more, but um, in, the sh in the short term, it's been hard to kind of, yeah, the, the kind of regular old bonds are what's been successful. Mm. I, Very encouraging. I, I can just, MSRB has started to do some questioning around what is good green bond disclosure look like. I don't, I don't know if it's going to lead to anything, um, but they started to ask the question. So it, 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 it is a place where we can engage and say, here's what we know from around the rest of the world and, and here's some lessons learned. I did just a really quick comment. So just to situate that question in a broader landscape, I'm not suggesting it's not material, but like 10, 20 basis points of price discovery you might get on a sort of a green bond. That's not really comparable to the fact that interest rates have just gone up by like four or five percent. Uh, and that massively changes the whole economics of capital intensive energy transition infrastructure. And I think that's where it's ancillary bits of policy like 
like um, like long-term refinancing um, uh, facilities from from the Fed or from from central banks or you know uh, bond purchasing things, things which are going to go into climate adaptation and mitigation kind of infrastructure, um, dual pricing, all of those kind of things. It's just like that's where the big pricing gap is. Um, you know, so so in a way, it's like yes, that's material, but in the in the broader in the broader scheme of things, there's there's a lot of other kind of uh, prices and things which will actually affect real economy um, economic. Well, so um, to conclude, do you guys want just a minute on uh, things you see on the horizon, policies that uh, we ought to be innovating toward? You've talked about something. Maybe this is an opportunity to talk about risk, how we mitigate. Uh, but I think we need to wrap up. I mean, I, I would just say that uh, every indicator that we see, other than these handful of U.S. markets, is moving forward on policy work to create a more steady and stable regulatory environment for uh, responsible investments that aid the transition. Yeah, I think, I mean, what encourages me, I don't know if what I see on the horizon is just, there's just such a huge amount of demand uh, for product and for projects. And I think that we, despite any kind of anti-sentiment, et cetera, that for me is overwhelming, right? Because the real demand is there. And I think the economics are kind of finally playing through, right? Like, you know, we've had discussions this week about, you know, renewals, renewables being cheaper than, you know, any other fossil fuel and not just kind of new, but actually kind of day to day running, et cetera. So there's, you know, there's, the economics are really kind of in our favor and the demand is so huge. So I think these are the kind of things which make me quite excited about the kind of next stage of the market. Whereas, you know, for a lot of my career, I spent going, yeah, it'll get cheaper at some point. It'll get cheaper at some point. And it's here, we're here, you know, right? There's huge Absolutely. amount of demand. So, you know, I think there's a lot, um, and there's a huge amount of capital, right? Like that's, that, that exists. So we have all the capital we need and we have a lot of the, most of the technology we need. We need to bring it all together. Small. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I think, um, just follow up to that. I think despite everything I said today, but also, um, Asia is always a very divided market, and also uh, it's quite difficult then with this continent to come up with any consensus. Um, but uh, I think from, from about from two years ago, definitely I think there's a great trend that within each market there's been um, more and more interest in, in coming up with an ecosystem uh, of uh, helping green finance and also uh, sustainability development uh, in terms of there's a lot more talents, I think, coming to the space uh, to join the force. And so that's a very great, I think, um, direction. And also the other thing is we are at the, at the dawn, I think, of having more consensus on policies and also on standards, et cetera, to make it more comparable. And also in terms of data gathering uh, to become much more easier for uh, different uh, players. So I think definitely we are taught walking towards a, a good direction here. And uh, I have confidence that in a few years, I think Asia will be much more sophisticated in terms of approaching uh, many issues related to sustainability and ESG. Um, I think that uh, so I've, if you look at policy, I've never really seen a successful policy that hasn't been grounded in collaboration amongst entrepreneurialism and innovation. It's like that's what creates the kind of the evidence base to be able to do something which then goes on and works. A lot of policy which has been kind of dreamt up and then it hits the market and the market goes, well, that doesn't work, and then it, and then it disappears. So in a way, what I'd like to see, and I think is on the horizon, is where can there be effective collaboration for, for things which are going to be on the horizon, the, the, the new innovations, because things are going to get disrupted. I mean, these hard to abate sectors like cement, it's just like, well, but maybe, you know, things like concrete, I'm in a, I'm in a startup uh, uh, hub who are doing zero carbon concrete with bacterial binding agents, but maybe we're going to be building everything out of timber skyscrapers, or maybe out COVID, it's not about just building more stuff, it's around, well, where, where do you get shelter and where, how do we manage connection? All of those kind of things are going to be kind of constructed it's going to be the right forms of 
of discussions and that type of interface between finance people and policy makers and entrepreneurs and businesses and communities and grassroots groups going, how are we going to organize it? And then policy will follow. Um, so that's my kind of hope for the future. Well, thank you guys for ending on a high note on, on everything. Fantastic. I feel so good and, uh, and really brilliant uh, conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody who's sat here does too. So let's give you guys a round of applause. Great. Thank you all. That was a terrific way to end the conference. And um, I also want to thank Sergio, uh, who has done an amazing job as the leader and chair of the IEFA board and whose vision has been so important to all of us and who has gotten wrapped into doing many unexpected things, including being the scout for the venues here in San Francisco. So I think you did a good job. That's great. Um, we'd really love to thank all of the speakers uh, from this last two days. We've learned a tremendous amount. And uh, it's been very generous for all of them to have spent their time. Also to thank all the people who organized the side sessions and the strategy meetings and the many, many, many networking sessions that went on in the last couple days. Um, the staff at the hotel and the AV folks have just been terrific and uh, so responsive, and we'd really like to thank them for their help. Um, yeah. uh, you already have in your email your conference feedback form. So we really hope you'll take a few minutes to fill it out. Let us know what you thought of the program, the venue. This really helps us with um, setting up Energy Finance 2024. So we will appreciate getting all your feedback there. Um, in line with our recycling and zero waste goals, when you got your lanyards, uh, there'll be folks at the door to collect them in a box or you could uh, give them back to the registration desk. Um, you know, they always say many hands make light work. And I can testify to the fact that this conference was not light work, <laughs> but there were many, many hands involved. And there's no way to name everybody, but so many people who organized the venue, set up the venue, invited speakers, served as speakers, uh, prepared all the materials and the PowerPoints and the, uh, ran the registration table and everything else. And we'd really like to thank everyone um, there are, however, three names I do want to name of uh, people who really drove this event uh, from start to finish, and they did it with grace and efficiency and a sense of humor. Um, and they are Sarah Weeks, our CFO, who was here a second ago. <laughs> uh, Julie Gasper, our finance and operations manager. And Jamie Stewart, our program specialist. So we just so appreciate the work. Um, oh. What? Why, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have little things over here, too, but I didn't bring them up. <laughs> um, so as we wrap up, I just want to thank all of you for coming. We know that you know, travel is still not very easy, and COVID is still with us, and it takes a lot of effort to get here. Um, and, but I think we all feel it's worth it to be part of this wonderful community of people who are working together around the world, and, and including with folks who couldn't be with us uh, this week. So we just would love to wish you all safe travels home, and we're looking forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you. Thank you.